you please. The, the biggest story to come out of ECW this month is the crowning of a new world heavyweight champion, Mikey Whitbreck, defeated the Sandman in a ladder match which was aired on October 31st, Hardcore TV. The title switch comes after a lengthy tease of Mikey chasing Sandman, even winning more than one non-title match. Whitbreck is now a triple crown winner in ECW after winning the TV title last year and sharing the tag titles with Cactus Jack. And talking to Cactus Jack, he continued his heel turn this month noticeably on these in-ring style. Fans booed and even turned their backs on Cactus after a lengthy match saw him work purely side headlock takedowns against El Puerto de Ricano. Uh, Jack also continued his string of home run promos really for the year during this month and he'd recently had a match with the returning Terry Funk. Alongside Funk's return to the company, October saw Steve Austin's first full month in ECW. Austin would shed his stunning moniker and now calls himself the Extreme Superstar. He is yet to wrestle on television, but spent the month between scathing shoot promos, backstage comedy, skits and run-ins with the Sandman and Mikey Whitbreck. Triple A's Conan would also appear more than once during the month. And in other news, gangsters, New Jack and Mustafa Saeed were recently released from pretty much any ECW commitments after the latest in a run any backstage altercations. Uh, New Jack had issues with the Dudley boys apparently during a recent match, but then took the matters back into the locker room, forcing a pull-apart brawl, leaving dances with Dudley and Mikey Whipwreck with injuries. Taz would also get into a verbal tussle with a gangster, but those two never physically came to blows, at least for now. There was also panic in the ECW arena this month when a planned angle involving Terry Funk's branding iron went awry. Funk would be on fire during a match, but flames made their way into the crowd with a fan apparently being set on fire. This came on top of several technical issues with the event where lights were dim throughout the night intermittently. And Raven and Stevie Richards reclaimed ECW tag titles this month. They defeated the Pitbulls and in a lumberjack match with both Bill Alfonso and Commissioner Todd Gordon refereeing and 911 and Big Dick Dudley serving as lumberjacks. The end of the match saw Gordon stripped of his shirt, beaten and then bloodied by Bill Alfonso. Lastly, clamours for an ECW pay-per-view took a large step this month. It was recently reported the company has an agreement with the William Morris Agency to garner distribution rights for what's expected to initially be a pre-taped live event showing Paul Heyman was recently understood to have said to fans in Chicago that early 1996 is not out of the question. Bob will join us at the end of the show to discuss the likelihood of this and what it could mean for the company. Thank you very much, Kieran. As we say, Bob will be in at the end just to talk about those kind of ECW pay-per-view rumours just really catching on fire at the minute, unlike Terry Funk. Um, also, a couple of our kind of discussions we'll have at the end as usual, but pretty much a, a straightforward month, at least TV-wise for ECW. A couple of backstage angles and stories, as as always in Philadelphia, but we'll fire on straight away with the, the first episode of Hardcore TV. October 3rd, we open as we kind of set out really for the rest of the month, we open with Beulah McGillicutty advertising our latest segment lovingly entitled Beulah's Box. Fans can write in about anything, she will read everything, and gentlemen, our box is always open. Um, yeah, we're going for that. <laughs> Let's get them uh, we come back, to, come back to last month's Gangsters Paradise showing highlights of the public enemy and Mikey Whipwreck against the Sandman New Jack Too Cold. Mikey obviously hit that sat at the Superfly Splash on Sandman for the top of the cage for the win. We then go to the back at the end of the match. Joey Styles announces the Gangsters will take on the public enemy in an actual street fight who determine who really are the kings of the hood. But as we said in the news, that match might be indefinitely on ice due to the run-ins of the gangsters backstage. We then get highlights of Steve Austin for a recent sports show. He comes out in jeans and a t-shirt before Sandman takes on Mikey. Austin calls ECW a shithole. He (laughs) says Sandman would get his quote-unquote fucking ass handed to him. And Austin accepts Sandman's challenge for the ECW title. Says Mikey's a good kid, but he's getting no place in the same ring as Steve Austin. As brief highlights of Sandman and Mikey brawling at ringside, we get a 10 foot steel ladder getting brought into the fray. Sandman literally hitting a leg drop from the rafters 
actually hanging from the rafters. Neil and Mike giving away drop for the win. Um, we also then get a, a cut to a later match in the, the back end of last month where Mikey gets a uh, Frank and Mikey for the top rope, looks to have it won to finally get that belt, but Woman Kane's him for the top rope, lets the champion retain by just dragging his body over over Mikey. Um, and as we alluded to at the start of the, the show in the news as well, Cactus Jack just just again running riot with these promos that he's cut and he talks about the old 2020 expose says wrestling will never be respected brings it back to Tommy Dreamer says the business is going to be the end of him he calls it the ECW fans and let's just let characters do what he does best you know I'd like to kind of apologize for my behavior I'm embarrassed certainly I feel a little stupid about the way I acted here out on this show a few weeks ago because I get a little emotional when I talk about wrestling, because wrestling's been my livelihood for the past 10 years. It's enabled me to live out my childhood dream. So for me to come out on a show such as the ECW television program and Bad Mouth, the wrestlers there, well, <clears throat> I'm sorry. But I think in order to understand what's going around my head and going through it, you have to understand where I came from and what my goals were when I got into wrestling. See, back in 1985, there was a program on 2020 that, that, that challenged the wrestling industry, kind of portrayed it in a negative light. And Tommy, if you're listening, try to understand that I was about the world's biggest wrestling fan. And for me to stand in front of that television set and see people running down a business that I loved and held dear, even though I knew very little bit about it, to see my friends laughing at me, saying that's what you want to get involved in. <laughs> and that night I went to bed, not with visions of sugar plums dancing through my head, but of broken bones, of battered bodies, of bloody corpses, saying to myself, if it's the last thing I do, if I have to hold myself up for a human sacrifice, the world will respect professional wrestling. Oh, and that dream came through. Yes, I've sacrificed myself for the past 10 years and left the better parts of my past lying on concrete floors from Africa to Asia to South America to right into the middle of the ECW arena. And what's it really done? Where have we really come to lying in a hospital bed in Munich, Germany, watching my ear being thrown out into a garbage can, not being able to take it on the trip back because I don't know the German word for formaldehyde, and having a nurse walk into my room, looking at that piece of my body that's laying in the bottom of the garbage and saying, this is all a Schauspiel. Which means it's all a big joke. <laughs> Excuse me, I didn't know. Do you open up the lungs of a smoker and say, oh my golly, I thought smoking was supposed to be good for you. Do you open up Terry Funk's non-functioning liver and so I, oh, I didn't know that four decades of heavy drinking took this kind of toll. So if they show that much respect to the patient, what made me any different? Because I was a wrestler, and professional wrestling will never be respected, no matter how many teeth I lose, no matter how many ears I lose, no matter how many brain cells have to die. And so it comes down to the point where it's just not worth it. It's not worth it. And Tommy Dreamer, you've got to start looking realistically at wrestling has a way to make a living, nothing more and nothing less. And as long as it's strictly business, well, you may as well be cuddled in the welcoming arms of world championship wrestling because ECW fans will be the best of you. You see, they realized, and they were smarter than any of us, that they rule ECW wrestling, not us. What happened, Tommy? You came back from all Japan wrestling with your trunks and your boots and said, by golly, I'm going to wrestle. 
the double, the giant barber hand you a dozen eggs and say, it tastes on Jumbo Saruta's head. You're a disgrace to the profession, Tommy. You're becoming a damn fool. And I can't sit back there and take it because I've got a moral obligation. You see, when I survey the wasteland that is professional wrestling, Tommy, try to understand. I am but a failed experiment in human sociology. And I can accept that. But never in my sickest dreams did I imagine that there would be other people taking dives onto concrete floors committing human suicide on my behalf like I'm the patron saint of the sick sons of bitches is that all I stand for Tommy is that all I stand for to sit in an arena where J.T. Smith lands head first on the concrete and hear the fans say you f*** up what f*** you who the hell do you think you are we're not a wrestling organization anymore. We're the world's damn biggest puppet show. And I'll be damned if I'm going to stand in that arena and let you call my match. One, two, three, jump. One, two, three, jump. Well, not me because I'm nobody's stooge. And Tommy Dreamer, if you had a little bit of pride or a little bit of common sense, you'd understand that those people don't love you. They laugh at you. You took the worst beatings the sport's ever seen, and they still laughed in your face. And I stood there with my arm around you six months ago and endorsed you, saying, he's hardcore. He's hardcore. Well, for that, I deserve to die a terrible, painful death, Tommy, because I feel responsible. And I go to bed at night, and I'm not sure where I'm going to spend my eternity. And you, Tommy... <laughs> my salvation be because by delivering you to a better organization where you can be appreciated loved and held with just the littlest amount of respect in the Turner family then maybe there's a chance for me too so please Tommy for my sake Think it over, because a yes to Cactus Jack would mean a great deal to me. And a no, well, I'd have to take that as you're putting a big OK stamp of approval on my eternal damnation. I'm counting on you, you little selfish don't make me hurt you because I can. Don't make me do it. And if I do, with God is my witness, it won't be in front of those little scumbags at the ECW arena. It'll just be me and you, Tommy. And you don't know when it's coming and you don't know where. So I wish you wish to damn me to the depth of hell. Answer my call and say, okay, Cactus, you win. I'll put on the suspenders. I'll groom that mustache. And I'll call Uncle Eric and say, count me in. Because not only would you be doing yourself a big favor, not only would you be helping your life, you'd be saving mine. You'd be saving mine. You'd be saving mine. So on the October 10th, we start off with Steve Austin and a, and a pretty scathing promo, as we said at the, at the top of the show. He's kind of retelling the story he's firing for, for WCW with an absolutely incredible Dusty Rhodes impression. And um, he shoots in the, the politics in Atlanta, how they held down possibly the, the biggest star, at least potentially in the business. Um, calls the ECW roster a bunch of misfits. They think they can wrestle, but Austin's there to show them how it's done. Um, we got a quick cut to the ring after a, a music video showing highlights of the Eliminators, Saturn and Cronus. Go back to the ring and we've got Fonzie Barrett and Taz. Jason, sexiest man alive, then comes out, attacks that dodgy neck from Taz. But Taz manages to lock in a, a judo choke. 
it doesn't look entirely unfamiliar to Sergeant Slaughter's Cobra Clutch. Um, interestingly enough, Jason gives a almost like a UFC like tap out submission as opposed to just like a verbal submission. Um, Taz then says Scorpio is going to be next. Jason comes to, but then obviously he's he's not a loser. Jason is not the loser of this match. It was an illegal manoeuvre. And it, it, Jason was in a car accident that day, and it, 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 it was just a, it wasn't a loss. Jason did not lose this match, um, and then starts just punking out this kind of young, young mast. It looks like it's going to be an enhancement guy, but the so-called El Puerto Ricano rips off the mask, calls Jason a pussy, and hits a springboard dive to the outside. Uh, Jason goes to the back and we then get Cactus Jack coming out. He's going to be taking on Puerto Ricano. He says he's got no future in the business and tells him to forfeit. The rookie manages to get in some some quick offense, get a couple of drop kicks, a springboard moves up to the outside. But Cactus then, as we said in the news again, sets up his patted elbow. The fans then start to boo as Cactus gets down with it, hitting it. Um, Puerto Ricano manages to get a load of kicks into Cactus in the corner. He even gets a couple of slaps, spits in Cactus. But Jack rakes the eyes, throws Ricanio to the outside. We've got a DDT in the concrete from Raven, who's out with Cactus. Rolls him back in, and Jack just goes on to him to get the, get the pin as the crowds turn their back. End of the match, we get Tommy Dreamer coming out, trying to make a save. He then poetically hits Cactus with his own apron elbow. Raven then clocks Tommy with a chair, poses to loud booze, and Cactus batters Dreamer. We get a couple of crowd chants for 9-1-1, but they go unanswered. Raven sets up the DDT, but Jack trying to get Raven in on this stick as well, tells him no, the fans don't deserve to see a, a DDT. Cactus then grabs a chair, doesn't even want to give the crowd that. He just starts working over Tommy with barbed wire, bloodies up Dreamer, elbows him through a table, and the two of them leave Dreamer lying, just to mass booze. Pitbulls then come out, Cactus and Raven just run away. So, gentlemen, I'll start with you first, Kieran. What do you make of this Cactus Jack situation? Obviously, we've seen him with the, the promos. He's been kind of cutting almost week in, week out this year. He's really stripped back this, this in-ring style and he's not even giving them the elbow, he's not giving them the hardcore that they want. Would you, would you make it as a heel turn? How effective Jenk it is? I mean, I said, I said on, a, on the last ECW one or the last couple, like his, his promos in particular, and it's like, you're, you're even more sport now. I know we'll get on to Steve Austin later, but to have those two guys cutting promos the way they do is one thing. But then when he also, he knows where he, uh, Catcher Jack obviously knows that he's just got this crowd exactly. He knows exactly what to do in a promo to get them, to get himself heat, to get Raven heat, to like turn the crowd against him, and then to do it in the ring as well is just. <laughs> I, I mean, Norm, if it was anyone else, Del, and I don't know how you, Chris, feel about this, but anyone else who, who you could almost see as that being too much of a tryhard, you know, where you try. Yeah, you know, you completely change your style, so, your, your wrestling style so much. It almost looks like God. He's really, do you know what? He's really overdoing it, and it's really not working. That bit where he yawned during a side headlock, I was just like, yeah, the guy's a genius. He's just like he just has that crowd in the palm of his hand. From like, he'll cut a promo before a match. He's got them. He'll start wrestling in a different style. He's got them. By the end of it, he's got them, and they absolutely hate him. And it's just, it's brilliant. Let's see with Jack. It is definitely, as Kieran was just saying, the way that he, he did that match in such a 1980s territory style of I'm just going to sit in a rest hold and sit in it and sit in it and you just know that this crowd, because they want anything but 80s style wrestling, it, yeah. it is the thing that they hate the most, and they know what they they know what they expect from Jack. They they expect to see him do the big elbow. They expect the barbed wire. They expect the hardcore for him to literally give them the thing they despise the most in this territory style. I'm just gonna sit in a rest hold, and you're gonna have to just enjoy it and live with it worked so well um, I mean it's like when you go with Lacey it's just obviously with the promo style as well him 
from the first week of TV when he does the expose sort of all of that about how wrestling has been exposed, how how everyone knows exactly what happens, and even last month with when he was saying about all these people that gave so much and now no one gives a fuck about them. Yeah. <laughs> that for him to just go, well, fuck you, here's a chin lock. It's just like, it's works. almost like a, it's just, it's just a constant middle finger. And I, I fucking love it. It's just, he's just constantly just like, you know, prodding the, I mean, this is like a, in my, in my notes, I said, this is a crowd that brings frying pans to matches. And now you've got like, uh, you know, one of their favourites who's now doing like Chris said, he's doing like 1980s, he's doing rest holds. It's just perfect for that character in order to get him as much heat as possible. And he, he's still doing it. And I mean, as you say, Lacey, this, this business has been exposed and you're probably not going to get much smarter audiences than in Philadelphia, but it just shows that if you know what you're doing, it still works. He takes a, he takes a side headlock take and he just holds it and holds it. And holds it. I mean, they even started yours. doing a Mex- they started doing a Mexican wave, yeah. which I mean, it must have been in that arena about half a dozen times. And it's Joe, like, Joe Styles was in on it. Yep, Styles putting it over, brilliant. And I mean, <laughs> Cactus, he must just have been smiling inside. Yeah, just like, yes. But it's the he's... fact that he's he's such the constant professional that his face during that period when they're doing the Mexican wave is deadpan still. Yep. 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 Just completely no selling it. He's, he's all he's always in the moment. He's never he never appears to be phased or it's it's like he's pl- it, it's almost Chris like with that. He's it's almost like he's planned. I know it's obvious to say because it's a worked sport in effect, but it is literally like he just plans it and he knows exactly what's going to happen, exactly what to do. That's the genius of it. Pretty much in a nutshell, and I mean, something else that we, that we just need to play now as well, I mean, it's something they'll probably talk about more at the end of the show, but ending up the, the October 10th show, just the way we started it, we need to hear a few words from the former stunning, now extreme superstar, Mr. Steve Austin. You know, a couple of weeks ago, when Eric Bischoff told his secretary to tell her secretary to leave a message on my answering machine for me to call Eric Bischoff. And then I called Eric Bischoff, and he proceeded to fire me over the phone. I thought a big cloud was lifted off the career of Steve Austin. Because gone were the days where I'd go up to someone and say, Hey, what about me and Sting? We got this big thing going. How about the cage? And someone says, no, baby, that's for somebody else. We're just going to keep you right where you at right now. <laughs> well, then I said, well, how about me and Savage, man? I got this great idea, man. He comes in. He's got the Slim Jim deal. Well, hell, I got... No, Steve, that's for somebody else, baby. <laughs> <laughs> then you go... I've got this great idea I can do with Hulk Hogan. I'm going to be the Steve Maniac, and we're going to take this thing all the way because Hulk Hogan, Hulkamania was the biggest thing to ever come down to wrestling's pike. And they say, no, that's not for you, brother. You can't do that. We're going to keep you right where you are. I said, how about me and Brian get back together? The Hollywood Blondes, it was the best tag team to come along in 10 years. And they say, no, Steve, we need you in a singles role, man. We need you to do this. We're going to put the U.S. title on you, and then we're going to take you here. And then you're the number one contender, so then you got this world title shot. Well, all that never happened. So there I am, floundering along. There's nothing going my way because the politics in WCW kept the biggest potential superstar in wrestling on the damn ground. What are you supposed to do? On one hand, they're paying you a bunch of money. They're paying me a bunch of money. Well, on this hand, they're telling me, hey, Go out there and give Bagwell a hell of a match. Go out there with an 18-year-old German kid. Give him seven good minutes. Let people see what he can do. They say you are what you eat. In WCW, 
They didn't feed me nothing but garbage. So I let myself become garbage. I became complacent with everything that they said. As long as Big Ted kept sending in the checks, maybe I wasn't happy with what was going on. But I became complacent. Then they send me to Japan, the big injury. Bischoff delivers a shot heard around the damn world. Steve Austin's out of the high-paying job. All of a sudden, the phone starts ringing off the hook. It's ECW. It's the WWE. It's all Japan. It's New Japan. And all Steve Austin's got to do is make a decision. Todd Gordon, whether he mortgaged his house one time, two times, maybe three times, came up with the right figure for Steve Austin to make a decision. I stroll into the ECW arena. It's the biggest piece of crap I've ever seen. I broke in in a building called the Sportatorium in Dallas, Texas. Home of the world famous Von Erichs. Anybody that was anybody stepped foot in a Dallas Sportatorium. For the last two years, all you've heard about anywhere in wrestling is the famous ECW arena. Debut night, I roll in. You've got the Sandman. You've got the Raven. You got the Pit Bulls. You got Stevie Richards. You got the public enemy. You got the gangsters. You got Mikey Wickrip, whatever the hell his name is. You got a bunch of damn misfits running around thinking that they can actually wrestle. All I've seen in ECW is a bunch of violent crap. And that's exactly what I'll call it because that's what it is. Steve Austin is here to wrestle. It's what I do best. It's what I do better than anybody in the world. Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero, they got the big send-off. Tears were in everybody's eyes. It was a big deal. All Steve Austin got was a good swift kick in the ass as Bischoff hung up the phone and left me high and dry. There's no Hogan's here. There's no flares here. There's not a Dusty Rhodes. And there damn sure isn't an Eric Bischoff here. There's no one that can hold back Steve Austin now. Stunning? Tossed it out the window. Never was meant to be. ECW is going to find out firsthand what Steve Austin can do. And I'm going to show everybody here exactly what a true superstar is supposed to do. What a true superstar is supposed to be. Because no one here can hold me back. Not Todd Gordon. Not Hulk Hogan. Not Eric Bischoff. Nobody. I'm going to be the superstar that I always knew that I could be because there's no one, no one in ECW that can stop me. Gentlemen, I'm going to come on to Steve Austin probably more at the end of the show, but something else that appeared in the, the October 10th show just before we move on to the 17th, but again, it makes a... A lovely appearance. Bueller's box. Chris, would you, would you make it as Bueller's box? Well, I was just disappointed that within the whole of this month of Bueller's box, did no one send any letters in? I was wondering that. You know, I would have thought, you know, with her They were too, opening bu- they were her too box. busy thinking about the box to write anything. Nah, I think their hand was otherwise engaged. They might have got writer's cramp. Well, you know, she was saying it was always open for us. I, 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 
you know, if it wasn't for the fact of, you know, transatlantic mail being so slow. I know, I'm waiting for mine to go over, but I think it's going to be like mid-November, and by that time the Christmas post is going to pick up, I and mean, I'm not hopeful for mine. <laughs> But I is do know when o- it gets Is it still there. open? Is it still it open? It will fill her box. Do we know? Do we know if I it's still know. open? I mean, I mean, I, I'm a bit worried if she's maybe not got a chimney, then Santa Claus might kind of make her own turn and end up going down Bueller's box. But, oh, Jesus. But, I mean, we started this show has seriously up. gone downhill since I stopped appearing on it. Anyway. Yeah, well, it's as soon as you hired me, Bob. <laughs> But I mean, Bueller's, Bueller's fans, I mean, apparently they have been, been complaining to ECW, saying that she only's got a tiny segment, but she reassuringly informs us all that it's not a size of the segment, but what you do with it. And yes, boys, Bueller's box is always open. Um, moving on rather swiftly, we have a new, at, we have, we, we have, we have a new Dudley joining Big Dick. Dudley and dances with Dudley is Bob, Bubba Ray Dudley, who apparently is going to be doing some ring announcing in the near future in ways somewhat pantomime. Stammer could well be a, could well be a segment filler and maybe perhaps even giving Bula even less time, but more into a bit of wrestling, seeing that's what we apparently do on this show. We have a, a rematch. Match two, at least in ECW, for Ray Mysterio Jr. and Psychosis. Um, going to be the first and pretty much the most kind of lengthy match review of the month. Definitely match of the month as per Hardcore TV. Not exactly a, a stellar month with the loss of franchise to WWF. We've lost Benoit, Guerrero, Malenko, all to, to WCW as well. But these two guys coming in, especially with the presence of Conan and the the show this month as well definitely shows that the, the ECW faithful don't need to quite worry yet about losing it in wrestling. Right at the start of the match, we get two suicide planches over the top from Mysterio, right to the outside on the closest. Ray clearly looking for the for the first fall in this now two out of three pinfall match. The two go rapid at it in ring for Ray hits just an absolutely perfect Hurricanana. Gets a quick three, leads a match one nil. The uh, quote unquote smart fans try to call out psychosis on a an apparent miss calling it a fuck up, but they miss a kind of slightly imperfect dosy Dolby Mysterio. Obviously it's just planned with the two guys that just know their cell inside out where they what they've done in Mexico. Ray declines a, a handshake, insegurity kick for psychosis, starts to boss over boss over Mysterio and there's a running reverse power slam into the turnbuckle a power bomb today gets a long two a standing spine buster for a Scorpion death lock Mysterio just kind of tries to get to the ropes and then flees out of the ring when he gets there just to try and kind of ease up the wheel a little bit Sikosis misses a corner charge Mysterio goes for a springboard moonsault but Sikosis catches him mid flight straight into a tombstone pile driver even copies the Undertaker's kind of Almost trademarked pin gets right back up and ties the match at one one. Odios mio, just to go back to my kind of native Spanish speaking. Got oh my god moment for Joey Styles as the closest that's a fly topy over the top rope, over the guardrail and onto Rey Mysterio who must be in about row three or four of the crowd. Obviously with Ray in there, Psychosis looks like a great god in the size of him, but the size of him doing that move right over the top, over the guardrail, over the crowd, just makes it look all the more, all the more impressive. Mysterio gets some momentum back, the battle back to the inside, the crowd's well inside of the two and before Psychosis sets up Ray on a table. As Conan says, they can do extreme, they just wrestle with it as well. Um, top rope, uh, top rope leg drop to the outside, from Sikosis, gets Ray through the table, Mysterio gets thrown back in, chair laid out in the torso, Sikosis then climbs to the top, has a corkscrew, spinning moonsault, gets the three, wins at 2-1, pretty fast, pretty athletic match, far for a, far for a five-star classic, but just, as I say, for a TV match, just ridiculously good. Kieran, what do you make of this? This was just, I was just, I, I know... Obviously, when they're moving at that speed, they're not going to get every move. But my God, the chemistry between these two is just, unreal. Yeah, it's just uh, it's again, it's like I did the last time I did ECW. You can you have to kind of watch these matches like two or three times to try and get everything. And I still haven't got everything in because I've happened to look at reviews all the time just to see <laughs> if I've missed anything. I mean, like the ending, the is it the twisting moon salt sent on thing at the end? I yep. mean, what the? F- <laughs> I've, I've 
it's just, and just the blend. That, you know, I think to to sum it up, it's just the blending of the extreme with the lucha was just like I was just like I I, I think that is the best thing I've seen from ECW outside of um, Guerrero and Malenko. It yep. it was it was that good. I would put it up there because they incorporated the extreme and the lucha. It almost took it above Guerrero and Malenko, I want to say, but that's only that's probably only because I've just watched it in the last couple of days, probably. You can absolutely. certainly you can certainly argue it, and I don't absolutely think there's, there's probably be a few folk disagree with you, but it's it's definitely a strong enough argument. It was just it's just amazing. Like I said, two three times I watched it, and if I'm still finding new things to like say wow at then that should give you some idea of what I thought it's just just brilliant brilliant well I mean even even watching these two as you say I mean that's for a 23 falls match this wasn't it all this went about 15 18 minutes yeah. TV time after well, that well I mean the um, first fall was like two, after about a minute and a half or yep. something I'm Mysterio just, went just... for it straight out, hits a couple of planches yeah. to that side it must have only been about 2-3 minutes yeah. got it 1-0 and then every pin fall was basically just a segment of TV time we'd cut to commercial back yeah. for the start of the second fall it was almost like in a like a British um, world of sport rules match. It was almost like rounds, <laughs> kind of coming back, going to commercial, coming back, and going to commercial, and then getting the the third fall. And as you say, I mean, watching this and still putting out the stuff after you've seen it two or three times. I mean, it's like watching airplane. For I mean, the first I've never time. Made, it's like then you get back I mean, it's and the watch. First time doing any podcast where I've constantly made notes every time I've watched it. It's just, Which, I was just, I was blown, I was blown away by it. Some, like I said, some of it was a bit ugly, but when they're moving at that speed and they're trying to pull off the moves they're doing, you, you can't really knock them for it, can you, really? Well, dare I say, I think even if you were the, even looking at it on microscope and was to say, we've seen it yourself here and I've seen it a good couple of times, I'd imagine Lacey's possibly the, possibly the same. I mean, seeing a match like this, I mean, you'd be lucky to count on one hand the actual, kind of almost botches that you would see I mean there certainly wasn't any that I would class as a botch maybe a couple of kind of slight timing delays but anybody that can do that do that kind of for the second pinfall going for the springboard and so for the top of Mysterio so of course it just catches him straight into a tombstone boom 1-1 one, one. it's like you, you can't you can't afford that Chris what was your thoughts it was the best of AAA mixed with the greatness of ECW thrown into a big pile of joy with free falls <laughs> you know it's we said when we did triple a that the concept of matches being free falls works for lucha because the speed that they go at like in the first fall in this where mysterio gets the really quick hurricane runner gets the free count that if that was the match and that was the end of it, we'd be going, eh, eh. Because it was really quick. As I said, it was in, been about two minutes. He's got the Hurricane Rana. It's an impressive move. It's a really good quick win for the first fall when you know there's going to be more. So the whole Then we cut to the commercial when all was coming back for the second. And, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. You know, because it was the same with the the two out of three match at AAA with the Guerrero and Art Bar. Yep. Where the first two falls were really fairly quick, you know, they told a really good story. They both were really impressive. First, quick, two quick falls. The third fall is is your big one. Once again, same here. Um, I, obviously, we know when we watched the play, we we waxed lyrical about Mysterio. Then, seeing like a bit more of psychosis now, I actually like him better. Mm. Well, dare I say, when's, I when's the last time you'd someday in a ring like Ray Mysterio Jr.? I know he's only young and must be like 21, 22 maybe at this point. He's still a young guy. Hopefully he's got plenty of years left. But how often do you see Ray Mysterio Jr. in a match and he's probably the second best aerial performer? Very, very rare. I mean, <laughs> you can't, you can't sum it up better than that. As I say, it was really quick, but for the work rate, that these that these guys were doing, even just lasting as long as they did. I think it was just tantamount it to the to the abilities of these two guys. And as I said last the last month or maybe the month before, I don't think these guys are even forty between them yet. And if they are, they're just in it no more. We're talking like nineteen twenty and twenty one, twenty two. These two guys, and it, if this is just a sign of things to come, Kieran, I think it's it's probably quite a brave statement, but it's certainly if anything deserves to be up there with. 
with Guerrero and Malenko. It, it, it definitely, definitely. In my, in my, in my eyes, because I think if you had, like, I know we're going to talk about. It's kind of where my focus is going to be when we're talking about the pay per views. I mean, if you could. You, you could have such a stacked, amazing card for an ECW pay-per-view if you based it around, you know, if you opened with this kind of match and then you got a Cactus, a Steve Austin, all of a sudden this, again, after the match, I was thinking after the, like, the second or third time I watched it, I was almost thinking like this ECW roster, it's almost getting back on its feet already. You know, when I the last one I did, I was saying like how hurt it could be without Guerrero, without um, Malenko. It's almost like he's restacking the roster and Heyman's able to sort of just bring in people at the right time and do the right sort of matches with them. And it's almost like the the roster's getting built back up again. It's just, it's unreal. I don't know how he does it. I mean, he's, I, I dare I say, I think Buell probably on a, a few black books, but I don't think anybody's is as good as Paul. He's when he seems to just find these, yeah. find these guys, bring them in. They lose this person, or oh, that's them done. That's it. The bubbles burst. He brings in two more. We then get Guerrero and Malenko getting away last last couple of months to to WCW. Ah, we'll just bring in Sicosis and Rey Mysterio Jr. <laughs> and then we've got Austin coming in, and Cactus oh, is just true. on a roll, and just it's mental. It's absolutely mental where he gets these gets these guys from. Uh, just a couple of last things in the, the October 17th show. We just get a, a promo video coming up for that Lumberjack tag match with, with Todd and Fonzie Ref and 911 and Dick on the Big Dick, sorry, on the outside. Got a couple of quick highlights for the match as well. We've got Bubba and Chubby and Dudley Dudley all coming out. They try to take on 911. They all lose out. The Pit Bulls have got the the match in hand with the looks at but Pitbull 1 gets stretched out Cactus manages to get into the ring unseen by well really kind of technical referee Todd Gordon just to heart back to the, the two former AAA guys Gordon misses it gives him the the pinfall as Raven gets just thrown in top of the top of Pitbull 2 they manage to regain the, the tag titles between him and Stevie. Post match, we then get that stuff with, with Fonzie and Todd Gordon, as we spoke about in the news. So Fonzie just rips the shirt off Todd's back, cuts him open, starts beating the commissioner down. Pretty, pretty sick stuff and for kind of two non, at least non um, athletic performers. Really, really convincing stuff, especially when this is a company that deals with Sandman and, Sandman and Cactus Jack on a, on a monthly basis. You know, the Dudley Boys, we got a little surprise for everybody coming next month at the November to remember. <laughs> We're going to have a special ring announcer. It's going to be one of the Dudley Boys. <laughs> now, I know, I know everybody thinks it's going to be me because I'm the only one that you've heard talk before. But wait a minute, wait. The reasons why we can't have anybody else is because, well, Big Dick, he's just a little too high strung. <laughs> Calm down. And, and the other reason, Sign Guy Dudley would be good if everybody was a bunch of mutes in the audience, but, you know, we don't really draw that kind, so he can't do it. He can't talk. Another guy that would be good. <laughs> that, that, I want to say something. I'm so happy to be in the ECW, and I want to say hello to all my friends in the Indy Reservation, because yo estoy, ya, ya, yo estoy tan enfonado, estaba aquí cogiendo cantazo que ya... <laughs> <laughs> See, well, now you know why DW won't be a good ring announcer. He's only on like the second book of ten from Spanish to English. <laughs> but the big surprise for everybody is the real ring announcer. It's going to be the new Dudley here, Bubba Ray Dudley. Bubba, say a couple of words. My name is bu 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 <laughs> hey, settle down a little bit. That's okay. Bubba's had a little problem with, you know, he had a speech impediment. Boy, toilet training was a bitch with this guy. <laughs> but we've been working on the eye-hand coordination with him, and he's doing good. Why don't you show him that step that we got you going, Bubba? Try You can do it. Come on. Take your time. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody have a pleasant evening. <laughs> Brad, 
<laughs> so straight into October 24th, got highlights for the three-way dance from a couple of weeks ago with the tag team titles on the the line. Obviously, before we've seen last week with the uh, the regain of these titles for Raven and Stevie Richards, we get the gangsters and the public enemy starting it off. Pretty much a usual blood and guts affair with these two teams, but the biggest point in the match just has to be the close with Rocco Rock Moonsault and Stevie Richards from the top rope through not one but two tables and just to keep it interesting the bottom table just happens to be on fire pretty pretty mental stuff especially visually fans run the ring eh, to celebrate with Johnny and Rocco at the end the ring just almost buckles with the pressure it must be at least two three hundred bodies on top of it um, cut backstage we've got an interview with Joey Styles. he's interviewing a Really just a pissed Stevie Richards. Stevie then challenges Johnny Grunge to a match where the loser will wear a dress, which I don't really know who I want to, who I want to win that, but Jason, world sexiest man, always on hand, weighs in with some fashion advice for young Stevie. We get a recap of Rocco and Scorpio this time, showing them battle atop turnbuckles, cages, flaming tables. The two of them are going to meet next month, and it's going to be actually the TV title of Scorpio up against the tag titles with Rocco Rock. If Scorpio wins, then he will become half of the tag team champions, and then it's going to be a partner of his choosing that he can pick to go alongside them. We then cut to the penultimate match between Sandman and Mikey for the month. Two of them make their way out to the, the ring, but just before they can start, just essentially bedlam breaking out in the ring. We've got the Dudleys, the Pitbulls, the Eliminators, apparently the rest of the, the ECW locker room as well. Mass brawl in ring, Steve Austin arrives. There's the on-screen debut for Triple A's Conan. After the ring clears, we eventually get the, the title match. Mikey and Sandman brawl through the crowd. Sandman starts beating up Mikey with the, the guard rail that actually strips the bits and just sandwiches Mikey against the ring apron. Back in the ring, we get a, a scoop slam, top leg drop, uh, top rope leg drop for the champion. He get, lights his victory cigarette, but when he's going for the standard delayed pile driver, back out comes Steve Austin. He hits the ring, gets Sandman, nails him with a ladder. Sandman's out for the count. Steve Austin then just takes his cigarette, has a little puff on it, and disappears to the back. Mikey looks to have the title won. He gets an Irish whip into the ladder on the Sandman, then hits a metal seesaw with the ladder, but only gets a 2, must be about a 2.8, 2.9, pretty close stuff, but the champion retains. He gets a leg drop for the top rope, then gets a leg drop for the top of the ladder. So close, but so far from Mikey. Sandman just losing the plot at this point as kind of Mikey runs him as close to losing the, the belt as he's came. Sandman then just starts annihilating referee Jim Mullen over the ladder and the crowd leave the arena with raucous Mikey chants. Then just building up to Saturday night's main event, probably going to be a big part in November's Hardcore TV. We cut to a, a promo video starting off with Joey Styles and JT Smith. JT living up to that gimmick he's got these days, he accidentally knocking out Joey Styles. We then get interviews for Tommy Dreamer, the Dudleys, Mikey, Austin, Cactus, Conan. Everybody's pretty much there. Definitely feels like a big night that's going to be coming up October 28th. So he'll probably play a big part of, big part in November's podcast for the, for the ECW segment at least. Oh, and Terry Funk is also back. Hi, I'm Beulah, and welcome to Beulah's Box. This week, my box is going to get an up close and personal feel for something that's a big stick of dynamite. TNT. You never know when it's going to explode. And best of all, it's live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Wall, where the big boys play with each other. I apologize for the balloons. But I had to fire the pyrotechnician guy because he couldn't show up. I did it over the phone, no less, but I had to fire him. Okay, right here with the big boys playing with each other on my right. As of always, Bongo. Bongo, how you doing? Okay. Now, the brain couldn't be here tonight. Pan over here to where the brain's supposed to be. Brain couldn't be here. So I had my secretary leave a message on his answer machine. And when he calls me, I'm going to fire him on the phone just like I did Austin. 
because that's the way I deal with people. I'm not a very brave man, and that's the bottom line. Okay, big show tonight. Like I said, if you're watching another channel, get over here. If you're thinking about watching another wrestling promotion, don't do it because this is the only one that's live. Okay, big main event tonight. Never before seen on TV. The most dangerous match in the world. And you're going to see it right here on Monday Night Quill. Oh, yeah. Yes, right here on Monday Night Quill. Bottle of Geritol on a pole match. First time ever in the world. You're going to see all the old codgers here in our organization. And they're going to be scrapping around and using their walkers, trying to keep the dentures in. And they're going for it because this is the hottest show on TV. Brother, this is the bottom line. We're number one. Did I repeat that I already fired the brain over the phone? Oh, yeah. This is where the big boys play with each other. Oh, yeah. Did I tell you that we're number one? Okay. I'm going to get up. Okay. The cameraman's telling me we got to go to a break. I'm going to tell you right now. I don't know the names of any of the holds, but I'm going to sit here and fumble around and bubble around. And if I put you to sleep, if I don't put you to sleep, the matches probably will. So bear with us. This is Monday Night Quill, and we're live. So last show of the month, October thirty first, Beulah Box, Big Stick, Explosions, you know the you know the rest. Um Joey Styles plugs the ladder match for the ECW title that's coming up later in the show, but somewhat unorthodoxly as it is ECW this title won't be suspended for the rafters. The winner of the match will be by pinfall only. I don't know if that's really a ladder match, but we will soon see. Um Jason comes out after a, a Pittsburgh squash and Donnie Allen and Tony Stetson. Most noteworthy, probably Francine's leather mini dress, but it doesn't quite kind of garner the, the right response from Jason. He comes out, he says to the Pitbulls he does regret selling their, tight, their contracts on. He says he would have kept them champions and tells them to quote unquote ditch the prostitute. Jason then manages to kick Francine in the face and out come the, the Eliminators, Saturn and Cronus. They come out, start beating down the pit bulls. There's a Hurricane Eliminator called to, to both of them. It's basically like a tag team, um, tandem leg sweep and spinning heel kick. Nails both, uh, nail both the Eliminators with that. Um, we then get Ricky Steiner and Taz coming out. They make the save, but Saturn and Cronus take it, Taz's neck, work over Rick. Pitbulls get back out and the goodies stand tall. We then cut to the title match for the evening. We've got Steve Austin coming out at the start of the match, introduces himself as that extreme superstar. He's not like the rest of them and can't wrestle. He's there to be the superstar and be extreme at the same time. Challenges both Mikey and the Sandman to give him a title shot after tonight. And he then takes women away from ringside over his shoulder. The two of the guys battle with the ladder. The brawler in ringside. Mikey tries to get in as much offence as he can, but Sandman gets bloodied up. Seems to be missing women. Back in the ring, Sandman gets a bit of control. Couple of one counts, couple of two counts, but Mikey's holding on. Mikey gets a near fall after a shot with the ladder, but after laying it the champion, Mikey just buries him under it. Ascends to the top rope. Hits a hell of a splash, to be fair. Lands in the ladder, underneath it, obviously, Sandman. Gets the one, gets the two, and Mikey gets the three. Mikey wins. Got a new ECW World Heavyweight Champion. Sandman's reign is now over, and Mikey Whipwreck is your new ECW Champion. The locker room just empties. They come out to congratulate their youngster. We even get a, a hug from Cactus Jacks. Comes out to hug his buddy. We then get a nice tribute to end the, end the show with Sandman's six month reign. Just a highlight, highlight package of that. And I mean, Mikey Whipwreck, your new, your new ECW champion. Chris, what do you, what do you make of the Sandman? We kind of done this when we lost the franchise earlier on in the year. What did you make of that reign of the Sandman? And what on earth do you make of Mikey, uh, Mikey Whipwreck as your new ECW champion? Well, we'll start with the match first. Yeah. Um, for a ladder match that wasn't a ladder match by usual ladder match rules, I was really impressed with this. The way they used the ladder was really good. It was um, pretty good, yeah. Sandman's jumping off it and that god awful leg drop that he does. <laughs> I'm surprised he doesn't break his cocks or so he falls oh, off that. His back has got to be knackered. It can't... Just... Maybe that's what he drinks as much as to take his mind off the pain. 
<laughs> but yeah, you know, for these two, I think that was actually one of the best Sandman matches I've ever seen. And to be fair, that's very high praise seeing the fact that <laughs> most of Sandman matches are god awful. Um, the, I like the fact they did the same sort of retrospective video that they did for Douglas yeah. when he left. Um, but it did just show that Sandman's really not done a great deal as champion. Um, yes, he was the hardcore, as we said, when he took the title. That, you know, Shane was the wrestling, Sandman's the hardcore, he's never gonna have five star classic wrestling matches, but that's not what he's there for. His problem has been during this title run, he's not really done anything of note. He, you know, some of the best matches he's been in haven't revolved around him. Um, last month, the Gangsters Paradise match was more about the gangsters and public enemy than it was about him and Mikey. Then you just happened to have signed one and make it there, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's been, a lot of his title reign has been non, non-important. Is that because you know you're not going to get a good match out of him or is it because they're not building stories around him? Mm. I don't know which is the reason to blame, but it's been an uneventful six months. Kieran, would you make a sound mine? Yeah, I'd, I kind of want to piggyback on that point that Chris just made. It, it, it's weird because the whole thing, I remember what Bob said a while ago about ECW where what Heyman likes to do is to sort of hide the, the negatives and accentuate the positives. But then his champion just seems to be, um, what's a really good word? Shit. He's just like, <laughs> there's just nothing. I've tried, I really have that. I've really tried, like I said, because I came to ECW, like I said, months and months ago. I came to it completely, total ECW virgin. But the champion has always been the person who I've just gone, I really don't care. I don't care about the feuds. He, he, I know it, he can't be asked. That's obviously his character, but he could, you know, he could try a little more. Like his promos, like woman obviously takes over most of the promos for him. She doesn't really do anything for him. He'd be so much better with somebody like a Luna or somebody like that, I think, but that's just me. But then that on top of sense. that, it's, he's just, he's just, his matches, oh Jesus. This is so far, <laughs> this is so far and away his best match, I can't even tell. And like I said, the unique way they had the ladder but not a ladder match was really good. Really interesting to see how they went. And I agree with, totally with Chris. It was easily the best Sandman match. Not saying a lot, but I was chuffed for Mikey because, my God, does that lad take some punishment. My God. Well, first, the first thing's first. I just need to congratulate you, Kieran, for mentioning your, your virginal ECW status <laughs> and not referring to Bueller's box, but that's another, <laughs> that's another matter. I mean, talking about Mikey, Kieran, what did you, what did you make it, Mikey? Where did you see this going? And obviously, I think we're all chuffed to, chuffed to bits for the wee guy, but what do you, did you see this being another Sandman or where do you see this going? No, I, it depends. It depends who he feuds with. He has to be. He's obviously going to have to be the underdog. So the person he goes up against, unless unless it's unless it's cactus, maybe I I can't. I just can't see who it's believable who he's going to be. It really. I, but sorry, it really just depends who they put him up against, Del. For me. I mean, that kind of sounds like a cop-out as, you know, I don't no, really know how it's going to go, but it really does depend because, A, he has to be the underdog because of his look and, you know, kind of what his character is. He's the plucky underdog. Mm. Um, so it really is, for me, who they put him against. I think it's a fair point. I mean, especially when we talk about the the last two as well, when you kind of see Shane Douglas as the wrestler with a promo, with NC Sandman as just the kind of hardcore icon. I mean... It almost writes itself that you would really think it would be cactus that's there because you've got the hardcore, you've got the promo, you've got the stories that you can tell physically, kind of verbally. It, it kind of makes sense. And then Mikey's obviously got that history with cactus. Mm-hmm. Is that what the hug was about? Is that kind of sowing the seeds for them going to be 
kind of back on the same side and then that eventually leads to the match down the road. You've got Austin kicking about as well, bearing in mind he's obviously got that that accepted challenge with both guys at the start there. I don't really I don't really know where it could just, go, Chris. Um, I just I'd go on. Go on. Yeah, I I'd, I'd just like to see like Cactus just tear him down. Do you know as like a character and a man? You can see it. Yeah. You're just saying and then sort of Cactus would be sort of I've got you to this point. And you've not shown me, you know, you know, you're not giving me anything back and then just start to tear, you know, the man and the character down of Mikey. I think that's the way they should go anyway. Pretty much. I mean, the story, the story writes itself. They say, what about you? See, I like the idea what you're saying with doing with Cactus, but I think with Cactus and Tommy at the minute, mm. I'm more interested in that story and seeing where they go with that than pulling Cactus out of it. Um, the obvious first place is to give him is to put Austin with him. Mm. You know, we've already got that build with you know Steve coming out and challenging it, both at the beginning of it and the whole of the month, basically coming out and belittling him, saying you're good for a rookie, you're good for a kid, you're good for the size you are, but you're not a real wrestler, you're not a superstar, you're not me. Austin is the obvious first port of call. Um, obviously, I know Austin should be fit soon. I know when he first turned up, he had about a month or month and a half off with this injury still left. Hopefully, he should be able to get in. That's where I would go first. If Mikey beats Austin and keeps the title, it makes Mikey more credible quite easily. You know, it gives him some status of he did beat the guy that's come from upon high and is pushing himself as the wrestler that's here. Um, it, the thing with Mikey is you, you just want to make sure, as Kieran was saying, he goes in as the underdog, but it has to be able to benefit him coming out of it, getting the rub for coming out as the winner, but yet still being... Yeah. Perceived as an underdog. It's very, it's, it's a tough. very intricate it's, weave. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a tough balancing act. I, I, I'm really interested to see how they do book, like even what they do straight away after he's got the title. What's his next promo going to be like? What's he going to be? What's the sort of thing he's going to be saying? Because I really, I'm really worried that they're going to sort of take the underdog part of the character away and he's now going to become more bullshit and more cocky and I really don't want that he's just going to be off TV for 30 days and then come back like a unit <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be like oh, 20 geez. stone oh, he's going to have a single oh, and he's just going to be badass like mini, Mikey mini <laughs> well I mean you can, the both he's going to lead that lead into there as well I mean it does come on to Austin I think that's I think that's the intricate weave that we're kind of a bit I don't know if it's afraid of is the right kind of term, but certainly kind of curious of with, with Mikey and Austin. I mean, if that is where they where they go with us, you want to keep Mikey strong as a champion, but then how can you keep a kind of scrappy underdog strong? But then if Mikey does win, what does that do to Austin, especially if it's one of the first matches that he's actually on and in an ECW arena, where does that leave Austin? Is it, I don't know, is it Austin and Mikey, but then Cactus costs Mikey the title, or costs Austin his shot at the title? The Cactus and goes on to them after Dreamer, I don't know. I don't know where it would go, but. So there is ways and means of doing it where you can still have Mikey fluke a win, yet Austin doesn't look bad. True. There's, there's, you know, he takes an absolute hiding, Austin shows off, Mikey grabs a quick roll up. You know, he he gets a fluky count out victory. See, there there, way, there's yeah, ways I... of doing it where he's still the underdog. Austin still doesn't lose any speed for being the the man that's this almighty wrestler that's come down from WCW. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't lose any shine. Mikey still gets the underdog shine because he's fluked it. So that's what I was thinking because the the other X factor which you don't get in the other promotions is the bloody crowd because they could flip on Mike you know they go the underdog thing thinking about that 
they could easily get fed up. Do you know if he constantly sort of gets lucky wins? You just, and that's it, that's why it's such a tough balance. Now it's it's one thing to like where you're going to take the character, but when you've got a crowd that's as ardent and as loyal and as you know they tend to like voice their opinions. That, that I mean they'll just call people a fat fuck when they're standing in the ring. It's just they don't care. The crowd well they care. The crowd cares, but. If they if they sense anything, they don't like something. They could flip on Mikey in a heartbeat. I don't think they will, but again, it just factors into this balancing act of what Heyman's going to do with him. I would love to see the crowd call Mikey a fat fucker. I don't know whether Big Val <laughs> can kind of pass on some colonies. Uh, you leave or... Big Val alone, you. Don't you? <laughs> and I mean, just going back to back to us, we heard them just earlier on in the show with that that shit promo when he came out and just started berating ECW and everything for what it's worth. We've also, just at the end of this segment, we're going to kind of listen to a bit of the, the kind of side of us that we never really got to see that much of in WCW. I mean, there was the, the rare bits in between as I've kind of harked back to before the match with Steamboat for the, the US title in WCW when he's kind of waving his waving his hand and talking to the camera. And I mean, Austin's definitely got this side of, of comedy to him. Chris, what do you what do you make of this first month with Austin? And we've, we've kind of seen the bull, the both sides of this coin, whether it's the the kind of angry, just badass Austin coming out in jeans and a t shirt and just flat him off people and calling it a shithole and saying Sandman would get his fucking ass handed to him. And but we've then seen this this side that we're going to come on to at the end where he's kind of almost written to bits WCW, whether it's the politics or the just taking the piss really out of, out of everything that happened in Atlanta whether it was with Bischoff or Dusty or Hogan or what do, what do you make of this as a, as a first month for is probably as big a name as we're going to really see in ECW as you were saying Del, um Austin's month this has been as you said from one extreme to the other he's had the co- comedy of tearing apart WCW and WWF and then that serious one where he was explaining why he got fired and how he was held down. It, it's making people, if they hadn't watched WCW, care about him. This audience may not have been watching WCW. They may not have seen the stunning Steve Austin that we watched when he had matches against Ricky the Dragon Steamboat and we were like, oh my God, this guy's amazing. Or him teaming up with Flying Brian in the fr- in the uh, Hollywood Blondes. These promos are doing so well to to show every aspect of Austin's character and the man that he is. The only thing we haven't seen so far in ECW is his working, which is going to come soon enough. And I think I think ECW could really do with his character with the refresh that he needs oh aye and I mean he definitely gives them I don't know whether it's like prestige or, I mean he's, he's got name value for the type of crowds that go to an ECW arena show but then when you're on TV regionalised as it might be you're getting the backstory. you're hearing about them going to watch the Freebirds and the Von Eriks at the Sportatorium you're hearing about the Blondes you're hearing about kind of where he's seen himself and where he thought he was seen by a, kind of enter really any random office name for WCW and comparing himself to kind of everybody else that's been round the, round the road and I mean it, it's really just been a pretty a pretty decent introduction to this guy considering the years that he's been been doing it I mean we're talking a guy that's been going about for five, six, seven years now and getting that, getting that insight into who he is, but not in a way where it kind of patronises the folk that know who he is. You're getting a really good, a really good look at him. And as you say, with the sides, it kind of, whether it's just talking seemingly for the heart in the middle of a ring, or if it's just these comedy chops that he's showing backstage and vignettes, it's, it's brilliant stuff. And I mean, it's just, it's really exciting just to see a guy like this in ECW because it is like the first we've really seen him there this this level from like a Shane Douglas and I don't think it's really much of an argument to say that he's he's definitely got the potential to be far far better. I mean, Kieran, would you make him for the for the month for kind of what we've seen him apart for that that in ring work that we know we can do? Where do you see this 
this side of Austin going, whether it's the comedy, the seriousness, we've definitely seen a lot more of him than we've seen in recent years in WCW, I'd say. Yeah, the, um, what I took, my, a couple of my takeaways from it was, um, it kind of, it's one of them weird situations where I, th- the injury has kind of benefited him because, because they haven't, he hasn't able to do the ring work. So instead of maybe giving him a few squash matches, it's basically given a chance to show this, this side of him, this more serious side and even the comedy side, but more the serious side. And it's really allowed almost as like this one big tease of what's going to happen when he actually does start wrestling. And the serious promo that he cut on the, you know, the being held down promo. Again, it just made me think of how like, lucky we are to in like one company you've got him and cactus because the way those two guys are able to construct a promo almost like they're telling a story it's captivating and again the way they use the voice because you know he starts off with the usual you know the brash he's shouting and then by the end of the promo when he really wants to make your point and he's right up his grills right in front of the camera and his voice is so low but the conviction's there because what he's saying is it's a promo. You know, he's trying to put himself over. But you can just tell that that guy was really, really, really pissed off. And I think it's just the he's benefited from the injury and he's not been thrown into the ring with Johnny No Name. He's just been allowed and this, this mystique and this almost like enigma of what he's going to be like in the ring is allowed to build through the promos. Now, something that we've not always spoke about this month, boys, it was almost a throwaway, a throwaway couple of spots on the, the TV show for the month, and it's probably something that we've came to know for ECW, where they have got that extreme side, but it almost is just a throwaway now, especially when you're getting the likes of the promos that we've heard for Austin and Cactus in the, in the show. Rock or Rock seems to be somewhat enamoured with fire. These days we've seen him moonsaulting Stevie Richards and a kind of through a flaming table. We even seen it then for local kind of sport shows as well with, with just flames in a ring. We've then kind of heard the breaking news of this kind of Terry Funk situation and he's bringing out the brand and I, and again, we hopefully know a bit more about that next month. I mean, has, has fire got a place in a wrestling ring? Is that a stupid question, Kim? <sighs> See, I've done it before with these ECW shows where I can start to sound a bit hypocritical because on the one hand, oh, I love it when they mix lucha with violence. Oh, I love it when, you know, what random weapon is the crowd going to bring in, you know, your mum's sewing kit or a frying pan or whatever. (laughs) And then the fire, I was just a bit like, eh. It's, it was, it looks okay as a spectacle, but it doesn't, really add anything because it's really going to sound bad, bad to say I'm almost waiting because obviously the next step up they're always like a game we've always said before Dale it's always a game of one up of one mm. up in the ship and I'm just worried that the next thing is oh somebody's going to be set on bloody fire and I really don't want to see somebody set on fire for a wrestling match so while the spectacle's okay I'm kind of worried that in the background is like what ECW they're going to see oh the crowd's going mental for the fire so Paul E goes right Set Terry Funk on fire. That's what I'm worried about. I might, I might uh, be going to, I might be overthinking it too much. But. Oh no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, cause that's, I mean, this is a kind of throwaway spot here discussion at the end with us, cause it was a throwaway spot on TV. Just like, oh, here's Rock or Rock going through fire, by the way. And <laughs> it's like, it? I mean. With, with how it was, how it was shown on TV, it literally got 10 seconds. TV that, yeah. time, fight, flaming table, Rocco moonsaults Stevie through a table on top of a flaming table. If you pardon the pun, do you think we've watered it down that much, Lacey, that that's what it is now? It's just like, oh, look at this. I don't know. The thing is, right, if they want us to see something like a flaming table and they want to make it count and make it worthwhile, then they need to... M- do it in how they're showing it on TV like that. That should have been the last image you saw was this guy going through a flaming table because then it makes it a big thing. Having it as we saw this month 
with it literally being shown in a highlight package of a spots of a spot show mm. show and the 10 seconds of highlights of another match it doesn't mean anything this do you whole... think that's what the issue is with just how this was packaged tv wise or do you think there might be definitely almost tying a kind of making a odds for their own back with just being that it is in Mid card angles, you've just got it in random tag matches. I mean, it wasn't even the same. I think it was Stevie for the title match, and then I think it was even maybe Scorpio. Yeah, Scorpio in, in the, the, the in sports the spot show. show. I mean, do you think it's maybe just that they just seem to be burying this in a in a mid card random angle? What, what do you make of this, Chris? I I think you're right with that. The fact that it's getting, as you're saying, buried. If they're going to do something like this it needs to mean something because what's what's next off the bird's nest through a stack of flaming tables you know what I was thinking flaming baseball bats C4 (laughs) fuck it New Jack comes out of a shotgun this is it with ECW Chris this is my whole issue like we've said we've said before like it's it's just a constant game of one-upsmanship and I almost wish like they teased the flaming table thing so the guy misses the table, the flaming table doesn't come off on TV and you save it mm. for a pay-per-view, but put it in a, what, like Dell said, you know, take it away from maybe the mid-card or if you're going to have it, have it on a pay-per-view, ECW tag team title, you know, fatal four-way team thing and then have the tables, almost tease it on TV, but like we said, it just kind of felt thrown away. Is is this thing, it's, if you're going to do it and if you're going to push the boundaries to that sort of level... It has to mean something. Because mm. violence for violence sake will just... Because everything in the ECW is top trumps. It's been seen, whether it's the wrestling side, because what started at the beginning of the year, we had Al Snow and Benoit, which was an amazing match. That was then beaten by the Guerrero and Malenko classics. Mm. Ray and Psychosis are trying to beat the... Malenko and Guerrero matches. So on the wrestling side, we're getting one upsmanship. That's great. If we're going to get the one upsmanship on the extreme side too, it has to count. It it can't just be throwaway. Or because otherwise, otherwise we end up with the you know where we have the is it the what's it, was it the two rottens, Dell? You know where they had the Ian and Axel, so our personal favourite in '85. Yeah. Jesus Christ, that thing where <laughs> they had the glass on the thing—that's exactly the match that Chris is describing. Where it's just, it's just, what is this? That's and there I say up. what we spoke about at the time with yourself and Tom Martin, and it was yeah. buried in a mid card feud. We'd yeah. seen it already. There was no story yet. Nobody was emotionally invested in it, and it just came and went like a ship in the night. There I say, not entirely this similar to the flaming tables last month. Yeah, yeah. And then last topic for the for the month, pretty big news that's been kind of doing the the run of the rumour mills over the last kind of months and even over the last year or two. We're, we're seeing the National Federation, we've seen WWF, WCW, they've got the, the clash of the champions. WWF's now broached into the almost kind of B-level pay-per-views. We're offering a bit of a discount and kind of putting on a slightly shorter show. It's maybe not get the same feel as a Rumble or a Mania or at WCW as a Starcade or even a, a Halloween Havoc and do a check out part one of this month's, this month's show if you haven't already check out the quagmire that was WCW's pay-per-view. Bobby Bamba is <coughs> now going to join us and we're kind of talking about ECW perhaps kind of getting into the, the arena of pay-per-views. I mean, the, the story that we got coming out near the end of the month a lot of it is kind of pinned in hearsay, but what they think might be a bit of a, a kind of almost breaking us into the market might be a pre-recorded show then airing in a live take delay, uh, maybe taking like a, a sports show as they would usually do, maybe with a bit of a higher level card on a, a Friday night, maybe airing it on a Sunday. Bobby, any, any more in this for the pay-per-view front and just kind of where do you, where do you see us going? I, mean, I think there's a lot of fact to the rumour, is it just the, the continuing rumours of ECW pay-per-views? Um, well, I, th- I think the, <clears throat> the the details on the story are fairly thin on the ground. I, I think in terms of what we wrapped up in the news is, is probably the extent of it. Um, in terms of 
where they're at. I think it's more of an idea at this stage that, than anything more than that. I know they're talking to the, the William Morris agency about distribution, but yeah, you know, that, that doesn't mean a pay per view is three months away, particularly for a, a promotion of, of this kind of size. Um, in terms of, you know, what, what it might look like a year, 18 months down the line. I, I'm not anticipating we're going to be sat here next year having reviewed the third ECW pay per view of 1996. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think this is a, you know, very much a, we've got an idea. Let's test the market as, as slowly and as, you know, tentatively as we can. Um, let's try and mitigate a lot of the finances we, we spoke about kind of with the, uh, with the kind of life to take deal and, and airing it on paper a couple of days later. Um, in terms of the idea though, it, it's not necessarily as silly as it might sound, providing they can find a, a pay-per-view carrier that will take it. Um, you know, you, one of the reasons I kind of came on this show to do this bit at the end was just to kind of bring some context in terms of what, what the USC brought to the table. Um, you know, they've been going two years and on a, on a similar level really in terms of, I mean, they don't have really have any television at all. Um, they just spread through what I think is probably a stronger concept to market in terms of shoot fighting rather than USC, which is still wrestling. Um, but with a lack of exposure, they've done some comparatively excellent pay-per-view buy rates in the last two years. Um, so yeah I, I think in terms of it, it, it's really the next natural progression for them in terms of if they can work it right it probably shouldn't cost that much and it has the potential to potentially do a fair bit of buys so they can get kind of word of mouth interest um, but yeah I think at this stage it, it's it, it, it's in its early stages and it, they're right to be doing it but I, I wouldn't be that excited at this stage if I was an ECW fan Boys, I'll bring you in on this as well. So obviously it is a pretty, a pretty exciting story if there is that, that legs to it. And I mean, as Bobby says there, I mean, we, I think we even spoke about this going back to last year, the, the, the inception of extreme championship wrestling, but it's like, is this something that we see in a, a big stage? I mean, would they maybe need like, would they need the national TV first if they got, if they get the syndication for that, would that maybe garner more interest in, kind of getting pay-per-view companies on board and actually wanting to carry this. I mean, Chris, what do you, what do you make of the, the potential in ECW pay-per-view? I mean, obviously as a fan, it's something I think we'd both like to see, but if, mm-hmm. kind of more from a business point of view, as Bobby was saying there, comparing it to the UFC, do you think there is, do you think there is a market for this? Um, it all depends with how much demand there is on the tape market. Um, obviously, we all know that ECW does all its shows, cuts them up, puts them on TV, and some of it then doesn't get shown on TV, and you can only get it on the videos. Um, depending on those sort of numbers, are they going to then go and watch it if you had to pay for it a little bit more? But you got it straight away. Because if you think Gangster's Paradise was the last big show they did... Um, half of it got put onto TV for the past month, but there's stuff on that Gangster's Paradise show that you will only ever see if you buy the video. So, you know, is the tape mar- library and market big enough that there's enough interest that people would then pay to see it? And if you're going into markets that only get it through tape trading say I know that it's obviously all in the northeast if tapes are getting sold in Texas there's a market down south if they're getting sold on the west coast say LA or something like that you know there's a market there and instead of trying to get TV deals is it easier to get a blanket pay-per-view for the whole country obviously I don't know the ins and outs of how the pay-per-view market works in the states because obviously we're in England and we don't really have pay-per-view in that sort of a level. We would have, you know, you'd subscribe to Sky and get it through that. Um, 
there's, there's but, also the question of whether anyone's really going to want to carry it. I mean, you know, we, 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 we've had stories this year about them not getting stuff through to, to TV because it was deemed too violent. Um, and you know, we're just talking about, you know, little regional syndicated stations that are putting this on at 1 a.m. Uh, if they're talking about national nationwide coverage, and uh, again, Chris, my, my knowledge of the pay-per-view market over there is not much stronger than yours is, um, that they're going to have to find a carrier that'll take it. Um, and it's whether there's trade-offs between what ECW would want to do on pay-per-view. Cause, and let's be honest, if they're willing to set people on fire at a live event, what are they going to do on a pay-per-view, which essentially becomes their biggest show full stop? So there's that trade-off as well. I mean, in terms of how how it would break down financially, I mean, I, I was just doing some digging um, while you guys were just chatting earlier on. Um, just through some of the UFC stuff. Apparently, um, the UFC pay-per-views, they were looking at a break-even point of about a 0.5 rating, which is about between probably 40 and 60% of what... No, sorry, between uh, 30 and 50% of what kind of WCW and WWF have been doing by Rise recently. Um, now, obviously, UFC, you might say, well, that's got less coverage than, than ECW, and it has... But equally, I think there's the specialty and the novelty that this is shoot fighting. I think if you're saying, well, ECW's got more coverage, fine, but it's wrestling. And I don't know whether that novelty is going to be there. Um, if they don't do it on tape, uh, I think, it, or sorry, if they do do it on tape, then I guess the numbers will change. But the finances are going to be a big part of this, and I think the, the coverage is too. It's a good point you bring up, Bob, especially with the UFC comparisons, because, I mean, it's the companies themselves are of a pretty kind of similar vintage there's the shoot fighting aspect to UFC that kind of almost comes across especially like a middle America it's almost like a taboo you've got boxing you've got wrestling you've had boxing you've had wrestling for the best part of the last century is UFC kind of maybe even more of an instant comparison with this ECW stuff where they've maybe even Maybe not beaten down doors, but certainly gave a good knock at a door that maybe didn't exist five, ten years ago. Do you think, Bob, that that, that, that would help ECW? I mean, there's then, there's then the aspect as well when you're talking about getting it on TV and getting it on national syndication with a pay-per-view. This month we opened up with Beck. Last month we opened up with ACDC. There's potential licensing issues here as well. I mean, how do you... How do you think they would be able to manage that for a, for a pay-per-view distribution point? Um, well, they, 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 they use this, this music on, on, on television. It may not be nationwide, but it, it's there. I imagine they just risk it. Um, what well, would be the long and short of it? But yeah, I mean, the, the, there are a lot of logistical questions that I guess we'll, we'll answer nearer the time. But I think in the short term, they've got a one find a provider that's willing to take it, uh, and then two work out a way. And there's also the the, the kind of the logistical and matchmaking aspects to all this, just in terms of, you know, ECW is a very month-to-month style promotion, and that you know they don't have anyone under contracts. So it's very difficult to promote that far ahead, and they kind of just you know. You know, ride with the wind, really. You know, ride on the on on the coattails and just just hope for the best month to month. In terms of a pay per view, they'd have to they probably have to build up to a pay per view for a good three or four months to really get the message around, really get the proper build in. But in terms of that, really leads to we need a main event. And let's be honest, right now they've got a lot of really interesting stuff. They do not have a pay per view level main event in their roster. I don't know. Maybe you could do Cactus Jack and Steve Austin, but who knows? Apparently Steve Austin's been chatting with the WWF this month. So, you know, th- th- there's a lot of things at play here. As an idea in embryo, it's fine, but I, I think there's there's a lot of things they've got to tick off to-, to-, to get to that point where they can do it. Well, Kieran, just bringing you in on this as well, it's actually something very, very valid that Bob brings up again, the rematch meeting. A couple of months ago, we watched two shows. I think it was Gangster's Paradise and Hostel City Showdown. One of them, I think we rated at about a three or a four, and the other one was about a seven. How do you think ECW could manage this? I mean, if it was a one-and-done pay-per-view, national kind of coverage, do you think they could nail it with a, a seven, or like a kind of top-end score and a rating in a show, or would it run the risk of kind of being that three-four slugfest? That yeah, you see, he, this is this is the this is. The, the blessing and the curse of having a product like an ECW is if you do not balance the card right, 
you you could end up with you 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 do end up with a three out of you know a three out of ten four out of ten show, but when they get the cards right and like I, like I said earlier in the show, this roster again he he has this ability Heyman to build it to build his rosters back up, but again, like you Bob you Bob and Chris have said there's so many variables with ECW there's just so much that even before you get to the point of um, what you know, what how the match card would go. Are they like Bob said? Are they even going to be picked up because of how the product is? Now, do they then, off the back of that, do they then have to? Would Paulie be willing to sort of tone it down a bit just so he could get a pay per view going? Then, does if they then start watering down the ECW product, is it ECW anymore? They definitely have the roster there, Dell. They could definitely build a really good pay per view if it was a one and done thing. I just think there's just too many variables in it. Well, I think one thing that definitely needs to get done, just right them up, is anybody that has booked in that card for the pay-per-view, I think we definitely need to confiscate passports and make sure nobody's flying to Japan. Just on the off chance we got another, we got another air shabu. But that will pretty much bring us to a, bring us to a close for this episode of the, the rest on 20 years ago podcast. I that was volume three covering ECW. My name's been Del Muir and I was also joined by gentleman Chris Lacey. Chris, thank you very much. You're welcome, Del. You can find my many musings on uh, the, the glory days of WCW. In, uh, at the minute we're at 1990 on Super Rules, which is found on YouTube, on the iTunes even, not YouTube. Um, or you can get us on Twitter at, at Super Rules. And if you want to see me ranting about wrestling and football, it's Lacey555666. And on Super Brawls, Lacey, are we kind of just tying to the end of the kind of glory years of the late 80s, early 90s, or have we still got a bit left? Well, the last show we just done was absolutely dire. And <laughs> is, is... Hey, hey the, the, the last show that we've done this month was absolutely dire as well, but that's a different story. That's just because our host or whatever above. It's it's one of those of we we've just done Clash of the Champions eleven and it's it's that point where it's a lot of the good guys have now sort of left and they're not putting the best sort of people together in matches. But I have some faith that it, that it does sort of get a little bit better at the back end of ninety and then falls really on its ass during ninety one. <laughs> Kieran Mitchell, thank you very much, Kieran, for joining us. Cheers, Dale. You can find me on Twitter where I talk about loads of bollocks at Jotun Thrash 666. And we're still not digging into that name. I just wanted to lie there with a blanket of mystique just shrouded over it. Bobby Bamber, last but certainly by no means least. Thanks for joining us at the end there. No problem, no, uh, no issue with just jumping in for the last kind of quarter of an hour. Um, yeah, Del, you'll do um, the main wrap-up, but you can find me on Twitter at Bobby Bamber. And also we've got cricket fan Bob and football fan Bob. Oh, there's about half a dozen Twitter accounts, but yeah, let's, uh, let's not go there. We could be here a while. Well, that's true. It's a very socially acceptable form of schizophrenia, I suppose. But as Bob says, just to wrap up for the, the show itself, do give us a like on Facebook. Loads of stuff on there, a couple of audio clips, a couple of video clips. Also got room to kind of start your own comments on there as well if you do wish. Twitter, we're on there at Wrestling20YRS. Give us a follow on there for Yes Bobby Bamba, Power Rankings and Sports Show results. What we hope. Yeah, well, we hope. That's, that's tentative at best, but <laughs> well, they will the, be there. These shows will go out on Friday night. I'm hoping they'll be on the website by, uh, by Saturday. Of course they will be. Just remember that. And also we can get this on the Wrestling 20 Years Ago website, wrestling20yrs.com. Get the RSS feed on there for the podcast. You can also get us on iTunes, probably before Super Brawls, but do get Super Brawls as well. So Wrestling 20 IRS, subscribe to the RSS feed, sign up for the newsletter. There will be no spam in that. It will just be a one and done for the month. Also, make sure that you never miss anything that's going on as well. Latest blogs going up. Get some ECW stuff on there, as well as WCW and WWF. And for the rest of 20 years ago podcast, that was Chris Lacey, Kieran Mitchell, 
Bobby Barnbar. I've been Del Muir, and until the next time, goodbye. <laughs>